Good morning, Open Door Ministries, and to all our friends and family on Facebook and YouTube. It's great to be back sharing the Word of God again. We are continuing in our series called Crucifying Our Politics. And as I have said in previous sermons on this topic, this is more of a confessional for myself. It's more yelling at myself. I was deeply disturbed by the last election in this country. Not only my own reaction to this election, where I began to feel anger, where I began to say things I should not say, but I saw it in my friends as well, long-term friends, members of uh, the church, that I saw divisions where we began to align around our politics, swearing allegiance to our candidates rather than swearing our allegiance to our Lord Jesus Christ. That politics has a tendency to appeal to our fallen fleshly nature and bring out the worst in us rather than living in the kingdom of God, which brings out our spiritual nature, which brings out the best in us as we imitate Christ. So, continuing on, crucifying our politics. Mission abandoned, I call this one. This is a picture of Rick Joyner. Now, I've been calling out quite a few people that I think have completely strayed from the path that they need to be on. And the reason I put a picture of Rick Joyner up here this week is because just recently he has made comments, he went on the Jim Baker show, and made comments that Christians need to arm themselves with weapons for the coming civil war. And when I heard that, I was shocked because I began to think to myself as he was misquoting and misusing Scripture to justify his idea that we as Christians need to arm ourselves and prepare for civil war to, quote, defend our families, that he missed the entire message of Jesus, who says to turn the other cheek, that he missed the entire message of the first century Christians who refused to get involved in military actions, that he has missed the message of Christ, who is to lay down our lives rather than to take up arms. I couldn't believe how far off this individual was. And I was shocked that he would call us to kill other people, supposedly to defend our faith when our faith is based upon laying down our lives. Are we a Christian nation? This is one of the big things I hear all the time. There's sort of this mythology about America being founded as a Christian nation, how all the founders were Christians, and they wrote a constitution based upon Scripture, etc., etc., etc. Are we to be a Christian nation? And I would say the answer is no, that nations are not Christian. There used to be a time when, a say back in the Middle Ages, a king would decide that he would convert to Christianity, and so he just announced that his entire nation, all the people in it were Christians too. Had those people had individual conversion experiences? No. They were just simply expected to start going to Christian churches and practicing the Christian liturgy, even though it meant nothing to them. And many times what we ended up with is people going to the Christian church because that was their civic duty, and then going home and practicing the same old pagan religions they'd always practice in their daily lives. I don't think we are to be a Christian nation. I think we are to be a nation of Christians. And when I say a nation of Christian, I'm not talking about all of the United States of America should be Christian. I'm talking about we are a nation made up of all Christians that crosses all borders at all times. That we are a nation in the sense that we are a group of people who have sworn allegiance to a singular king, which is Jesus Christ. Which means that my brothers and sisters in Ethiopia, my brothers and sisters in Ghana, my brothers and sisters in Venezuela, my brothers and sisters in China and Taiwan, we are all one singular nation. There may be lines drawn on a map, but we are bound together around one king, one throne. I want to talk about 
Babylon as what we call a sacral empire. Now, in the Old Testament times, Babylon, this great empire, was what we would call a sacral empire, that religion and civic life were not separate. That if the king of Babylon said everybody is expected to bow down to this statue, everybody was expected to bow down to that statue. It had nothing to do with ideas of personal conversion, personal belief, personal faith. It had everything to do with the king says it, this is part of empire, this is your civic duty, so just go and do it. And everybody was expected to join in the worship that the empire practiced. The same thing was true of Rome. Rome was a sacral empire. Everybody was expected to join in in civic worship of the gods of the Roman Empire. If you lived in Ephesus, you would have been expected to join in along with the chance that Diana is your god. And it had nothing to do with a lifestyle change or personal conversion or who you were. It was simply, this is my civic duty. But first century Christians stood out, and many of them lost their lives because they were not sacral. They divorced themselves from a civic religion to follow after their one and only king, which was Jesus Christ. That because they refused to join in civic religion, they oftentimes lost jobs and friends and their lives. And that this is one of the defining characteristics of being a Christian, that we are no longer swearing allegiance to empires, kings, leaders, rulers, that we no longer practice civic religion, that we do not seek a religion for a nation, but instead we have joined a new nation formed around Jesus Christ. If you look at 1 Peter, in the second chapter, Peter reminds us of this call. He calls us a nation of holy priests. He says, but you are a chosen people. And he's not talking about the chosen people, the Jewish people, but he's talking about Christians, which now included both Jews and Gentiles. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him whom you were called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Not only were we called from death into life through Jesus Christ, but out of darkness, out of the kingdoms of this world, into the kingdom of God, into the light. And we were formed as a new nation as that happened. That we were no longer citizens of Ephesus. We were no longer citizens of Rome. We were now citizens of the kingdom of God. And as such, we were a special people. We were Jew. We were Gentile. We were Greeks. We were Romans. We were every person who chose to swear allegiance to Jesus, our King. I think it's kind of interesting you know, one of those very popular slogans around there that we see all the time is, not of this world. I am not of this world. And they have this beautiful little logo, and you'll see this bumper sticker everywhere, and you'll see it on T-shirts and people wearing it, and it's a, one of their ways to proclaim themselves as a Christian. But I always find it highly ironic when I see one of these stickers, not of this world, right next to a political campaign bumper sticker on a car. Because when you put that political campaign bumper sticker on your car, you are indicating, I am of this world. I'm involved in the civic religion and politics. I find it funny when you see one of these not of this world stickers on a car right next to a sticker that says, God's gun and country. Because there's nothing more that can indicate to me that you are part of this world. And so, yes, it's a pretty logo, but they're not living out the message of this logo. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, because I believe that this really carries a very strong message that Peter was giving to these first century Christians as they navigated 
disentangling themselves from this world as they navigated the path of breaking away from empire and politics and the kingdom of this world and learned to live within the kingdom of God, having become a new nation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says this, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice, of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. These first century Christians, these babes in Christ, had seen, had tasted, had experienced that God is indeed good. Within the fellowship of those of those early Christians that they came into contact with, they saw the goodness of the Lord. They experienced the goodness of the Lord. And Peter says, Ex desire this pure spiritual milk. Desire the things of this kingdom of God, not the things of this world. In fact, you're going to need to break away from the kingdom of this world. You need to get rid of malice. You need to get rid of deceit, of the hypocrisy, the envy, and the slander of every kind. And if you were here and paying attention over the last four years, we have seen a steady stream of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind across every social media platform against, our, against the platforms of our mainstream media as well that as politics has dominated American culture for the last four years, we were drenched in malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. For those are the things of this world. Those are the tools of politics. And it hurts me to say, and I'm ashamed to say that I was as involved as many other people I know, but we are not to be involved in those things. Do we need an example? How about this one? Christian pastor claims Ossif Warnock are demonically possessed. This was about the Georgia runoff elections that happened this year. E.W. Jackson, supposedly a pastor who preaches the gospel, who is to lead us within the kingdom of God, out and out slanders these two individuals, slanders them by calling them demonically possessed. And he may have couched it in such a way, he may have said it in such a way that he avoided the legal definition of slander. But these are divisive and slanderous words that no pastor should ever be involved in. Let me make this perfectly clear. I have come to the conviction and I hold myself to the standard that any pastor who tells you who you need to vote for or which political party you need to vote for should step away from the pulpit. They are no longer a pastor, they are a political activist. And they have ceased to function within the kingdom of God and are now functioning in the kingdom of this world. This statement this political activism from the pulpit was exactly malicious, deceitful. It showed hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Exactly what Peter warned us about. Here's a picture, United States, divided. And we can talk about it, and it's, it's clear that we live in a very divided nation. But that is exactly what the kingdom of this world wants. It wants division. It wants tribalism. It wants nationalism. It wants a division. For it uses those divisions. It stirs up fear. It stirs up anger. It stirs up division for political gain. It uses those as tools to manipulate people. And as long as it can keep this nation divided... They can continue. Our politicians can continu continue. The corporations can continue to manipulate the American people for their own personal and corporate gains. This 
is the kingdom of this world. And so when we as Christians enter into our church, these are the things that we should not find. We should not find fear being taught. To say that if you vote for this candidate, you'll be putting demons in office. That is a spirit of fear that does not belong in the church for Jesus has not given us a spirit of fear. If we become angry and we start lashing out at various candidates and we start lashing out at our own brothers and sisters sitting in the seats next to us in church because of the way they voted, that is appealing to our fleshly nature. And that doesn't belong in church. Jesus taught us to love one another. Jesus taught us to love our neighbor. Jesus taught us to love our enemy. And however you think of that person sitting next to you in church, whether as one another or as your neighbor or as your enemy, you have an obligation to love them. And turning your anger towards them and choosing to disassociate with them because of their political allegiance means that you have abandoned your allegiance to Christ. You have ceased to follow his command. And division does not belong within the church. Over and over again, we are called to unity. And yet our enemy has come in and sown division amongst the church. Theological divisions, sociological divisions, most of the issues that plague the church today are more about politics and how American culture and society should be run rather than issues of the church. Is there not an agreement? Is there not a unifying principle within the church that we have only one allegiance to Jesus Christ, that he is our king? Do we not all agree on that? Is that not our unifying principle? Continuing on in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I am a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Jesus gave us a specific message to serve others, to love others, to serve others, to lay down our life if necessary, to be uncompromising with this world, to follow him. He told us on more than one occasion, we must count the cost of following him. And that cost is that we must die to this world. And yet, the American church today has chosen not to die of this world, but to embrace the politics of this world because they think that will lead them to the kingdom of God. They have abandoned the message of Christ. They have abandoned the mission set before us to look for a different pathway. Why have we done this? It doesn't make sense to me. Again, continuing on in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Catch that verse. Once you were not a people. He's not speaking to the Jewish people. He's speaking to the church. And he's looking at the church. And he's looking at Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. 
He's looking at everyone. He's looking at people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. He's looking at them and saying, you guys weren't a people before. You were a Greek and you were a Roman. You were a slave and you were free. You were a Jew. You were a Gentile. He's looking at these different people and he said, you weren't a people at one time. But God has made you a people. God has made you one nation, a special nation, a nation of holy priests. And you are precious to him. We have been brought together out of our nations and our tribes. We have been brought out of all the divisions and separations of this world into one nation centered around the throne of Jesus Dear friends, Peter goes on to say, Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, did you catch that? As foreigners and exiles, we may be living in America, but we are foreigners. We are just passing through this country. It happens to be where I was born. But it is foreign to me. It is not my country. My nation, my allegiance belongs to Christ. I am an exile I'm sure right now this message that I'm preaching, that I'm standing up here and saying will get me exiled from a lot of groups I used to belong to. Trust me, I was raised an evangelical. To them, <laughs> I have been exiled. I have many a former evangelical friend who has broken off relationship with me and contact with me. They have exiled me. It's what Peter said would happen. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. To abstain from sinful desires. What desires? The things of this world. To desire the things of this world. The lust of the flesh. Seeking power, seeking greed, seeking influence, seeking wealth. Putting those things first over the kingdom of God. That I'm to seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness rather than all the things of this world. I need to abstain from those. And politics is just one tool to get the things of this world. We need to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And then he gives us an instruction. This is our mission, ladies and gentlemen. This is how we were told to live. This is the teaching that we have abandoned. This is the teaching that comes not only from Christ, but from Peter and from Paul. This is the teaching of what we are supposed to be doing, to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Hear that again. I got to say that. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our lives should imitate Christ so much. Our lives should reflect God so much that when they see us, they see Christ. We need to be the visible presence of Christ in this world today. We need to be the hands and the voice of Christ today, doing good to everyone, not just one another, not just to our neighbor, but even to our enemy. This was a consistent teaching of Jesus throughout the Gospels. Over and over again, in those first centuries that Christianity began to grow, people were attracted to Christianity because they saw the lives of Christians. When plague hit the cities, it was the Christians who built the hospitals and took care of the sick. When people were hungry, they not only took care of people within the church, they took care of people outside the church. When people needed prayer, it was Christians who went. Over and over again, Christians served not only their own, but those outside. And people were attracted to that. They saw a great light. They saw the reflection of God within these people. And they wanted it. They wanted it. I think of 
an organization not far from here. It's an organization that Open Door Ministry supports. It's called Christian Outreach in Action. Three times a day, they are providing meals for homeless people. Three times a day. Those who are hungry, whoever you are, come and eat. Some of the people have homes. They've just run out of money at the end of the month. Their paycheck doesn't stretch far enough, and they come and they eat. Whoever's hungry, homeless, not homeless, whoever you are, you need a meal, there it is. Three times a day they do this, and they get other churches involved. They help organize other churches from all kinds of denominations to come together and to serve those who are hungry. Nothing reflects Christ more than that simple action. And people look at it and they say, I want to become part of it. And they volunteer their time to go down there and cook meals. They volunteer their money and their resources. Let me come down there. Let me help out. Because they realize this is something I want to be part of. Even people who don't belong to churches will sometimes go down there and volunteer because they want to be part of the good works that are going on. This is what we need to be as Christians. This is what we have been instructed. This is the mission that we were given. Why have we abandoned it to become malicious and deceitful and slanderous trying to pick up the tool of politics which is doomed to fail to accomplish God's mission of evangelizing the world. I don't understand that. In Matthew 5, 16, it says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. We should be focused on loving and serving humanity. We need to go back to building hospitals. We don't need megachurch pastors who are buying jets and mansions. We need megachurches to build hospitals and hospices and homes for the homeless. And we need megachurches to start building convalescent homes for the elderly and staffing those homes. We need Christians who are doctors and nurses to go and open clinics in the poorest parts of this city. We need churches that are awash in finances right now, that have plenty of money, that don't worry about money, to start opening up microloan centers for people to go to instead of the usurious interest rates at check cashing places. There is so much that the church could be doing, so many good works. And wouldn't it be great if the world could look at us and say, wow, those Christians are something special. Look how much they love humanity. Look how much they serve other people. They don't even just, it's not just their own people that they're taking care of. It's the ones outside of the church that they're taking care of. They really care. You know, I need to go check them out. Rather than people looking at us and saying, why do we have these pastors who live in billion dollar mansions flying around in private jets when there are people who are sitting one block from their church hungry? Why do we have Christians who are so involved in politics that it brings out the worst in us and people are leaving the church because of it? If you read the book Unchristian, that is one of the top six reasons why people are leaving the church. Because of we've become too political. Let us get back to what our mission is, to be the light to the world and allow our light to shine on this world and reflect the glory of God, to reflect the very character of Christ. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, Paul says, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in this world. Let's not act like the world. Let's not murmur and dispute and do the things of this world that appeal to our flesh. But let us be blameless and harmless. Let us serve. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, but we are to shine as lights of this world. 
Jesus said we can't serve two masters. Jesus said we can't serve two masters. John of Patmos in the book of Revelation said there's two kingdoms. You've got to make a choice. You can't compromise. If you had to choose, if you were a first century Christian and you had to choose between Jesus and Caesar, which would you choose? And I know there are a lot of people who are like, well, I, I would have said, you know, I, I would have been a martyr. I, I, I would have allowed them to, to kill me. But we face the same choice today. If you had to choose between Jesus and America, which would you choose? You can't be a political activist serving America and American interest, which are corporate interest, and at the same time serve the kingdom of God. For you will love one and you will despise the other. Christian, flee from politics. You have to make a choice. Where is your allegiance? To a nation or to Christ? For the two cannot mix. Christ and Caesar cannot shake hands and embrace each other. It doesn't work. Mission abandoned is what I called this. Our mission was to live Christ-like lives, showing a better way, being the light of the world, because that light attracts. We've gotten so far away in the way we were to evangelize. We stand up and we present very slick presentations and call people down to the altar as the band plays one more time. And yet, our lives, when you look behind the scenes of many of these evangelists, of many of these pastors and preachers, it's disgusting. How many fallen pastors and preachers do we have? Why aren't we doing evangelism as the first century Christians did? That not only did they speak, but they lived it every day. Oh yeah, there were a few evangelists who went, Peter and Paul, that went out and they spread the word and they preached the word. But the rank and file of the early century Christians simply served and loved humanity day in, day out. They took care of those in need. They fed the hungry. They clothed the naked. They visited those who were sick and in jail and took care of them. That's how they preached the word, by living it, by incarnating it. Our mission was to live Christ-like lives, to show this better way. Jesus was our example. He showed us a better way. He showed us that when they come against you because of what you teach, because of the way you live, then you lay down your life. He allowed them to crucify him rather than fight against him. He could have raised an army. He could have led us to a violent civil war in the Roman Empire. But he chose to show us a better way, that I would rather die. I will not harm others. I will lay down my life out of love. I will go the most extreme route of love you have ever seen, and I encourage you to do the same. We abandoned our mission and chose to operate in the kingdom of this world by picking up politics. And we have become corrupted. We have entered this adulterous relationship. We have become the very whore of Babylon, writing a false religion. We no longer serve Christ. We serve another kingdom. In Joshua, Joshua gathers the people of Israel together just before they are to cross over into the promised land. And he calls them together and he says this, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is your challenge today. Will you serve the American gods, the gods of the corporation, the gods of politics, the gods of greed and wealth, the gods of independence, 
the gods of democracy, the gods of capitalism? Will you serve those gods? Or will you choose to serve Christ? Will you serve the gods of the land in which you now dwell? Or will you serve Christ? For you cannot serve both. It's a challenge I speak to myself. As I said, I was raised an evangelical. I was raised to be a culture warrior. I was raised to be the Joshua generation. I was raised to be a political activist. And in these last four years, I have seen where that leads. I've seen what it did to me. I've seen what it brought out of me, and it wasn't pretty. It was of the flesh of this world. And I struggle now to renounce all of that and to return to where I need to be, gathered around the throne of Christ, serving one and only Master. How do we live this all out? Well, we could follow the example of St. Polycarp. You know, as I said before, you know, I, I, we were forced to read Fox's Book of Martyrs in high school. Of course, they reframed it for us. They didn't put it in the original context that it should have been, so we got a twisted message. But going back and looking at some of the lives of the early Christians, it's amazing. St. Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna, and he had been brought before a Roman magistrate for not practicing the civic religion, for refusing to bow to empire and practice the civic religion. And the magistrate offered to spare this elderly saint's life if he would just place a pinch of incense in a brazier burning before a statue of Caesar. That's all he had to do. The most minute offering you could give. Just, just a little incense in that brazier. That's it. And you can walk from here. Just compromise that much. Just a pinch. And Polycarp refused. What he said was this, 80 and six years have I served Christ, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Polycarp was tortured and put to death because he was not of this world. He was tortured and put to death because he would not compromise the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world. He wouldn't play politics. He didn't seek wealth in this world. He didn't seek influence. He didn't seek power. And yet, he inspired. He inspired people, not only for generations, but for centuries. For centuries. To become a Christian like him to become a Christian like him. This is the mission that we're on, to let our light shine. This is the mission that we're on, to imitate Christ. This is the mission that we're on, to serve others as Christ served us. Let us not abandon our mission. With that, let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Forgive me for where I went wrong, where I, where the worst of me was brought out at so many times. Help me, Lord, to reaffirm my allegiance to your kingdom. Bind me together within your holy nation, your people, the people that don't belong to the nations of this world, the people who don't belong to the political systems of this world. Join me together in that great nation of holy priests. Father, just help us in these trying times. It's difficult for us as Christians who have been bombarded, bombarded with message after message constantly over every television channel, every radio station, every piece of social media that tells us to join in to the kingdom of this world. Help us to put those things aside and stay firmly fixed upon you and your teaching 
Help us to lay down our lives to serve others. Father, I'm just praying right now for the churches that have been divided by politics, for the families that have been divided by politics, for the friendships that have been divided by politics. Father, call them back to you. Let them see that politics is of this world and that they can gather around you in one unifying voice. We will not be able to unify with this world, but we can be a light to this world and draw men in, to draw in all humankind as you did. Let us be that light once again. We just pray these things in your name. Amen. And with that, that's a wrap. May God bless you. Go in peace.